Made from the dust and breathed into life, he stood on a shame with a fire in his eyes. The image of God walking upon the world. All of the earth was under his feet, except for. blessed that through technology that you can be worshiping with us no matter you're in whether you're in Germany Asia or elsewhere throughout the world may the word of God richly bless you please join me for a word of prayer gracious God our Heavenly Father we praise you and thank you for your unconditional love for us through your love you sent us your one and only son Jesus to die on a cross for all of our sins, that through your Son, Jesus, we are made righteous in your sight. Father, we thank you that we can come before you today to hear your holy word. We thank you that through your word, you have revealed yourself to us. Speak to us today. Strengthen and nourish our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow
Please join me for confession and absolution. Holy and gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Some of our sins we know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which we are ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus, we ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore us that we may live in peace. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is recorded in Isaiah, the 29th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. For you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say, read this, please, they will answer, I can't, it is sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and they say, read this, please, and they will answer, I don't know how to read. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us, who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is form say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? In a very short time, will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field seem like a forest? In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is recorded in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. 
for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. Mark, the seventh chapter, beginning at the first verse. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, greetings. I'm so glad you can uh, join us just remember to hit uh, subscribe, and uh, if you want to support our ministry, keep us in prayer. If you like to give, there are many different ways to do it. Um, the snail mail, or you can uh, get onto our website, zionsf.org, and um, hit the give button. But we're so blessed that you can be here. And I always like to start with something funny. And um, one time there was a woman, uh, she had a heart attack, and she ended up in the hospital. Now, when she was in the hospital, she had a near-death experience, NDE, and, and she, her, her spirit left her body, and she met God. And in this short um, meeting with God, she had a conversation. She asked God, is this it? Is my life over? And God said to her, no, you have 30 more years, okay? And so when she woke up in the hospital, she realized that she had another 30 years. And during her recovery, while she was in the hospital, she decided to make the most of every opportunity. Isn't, isn't that what we talked about last week? The most, making the most of every opportunity. So she decided, as she was recovering from the heart attack, to get an upgrade. And so she got a tummy tuck liposuction, um, cosmetic surgery. Um, she did 
as much as she could to upgrade her looks. In fact, not only did she upgrade her looks, she got somebody to cut her hair, dye her hair in the hospital. When she was all ready to go home, all fully recovered, she walked out of the hospital and somebody, a speeding car, ran a red light and killed her. Now this time, she really ended up at the pearly gates of heaven and she sees God and she complains to God, God, I thought you said I had another 30 years to live. Well, God said, I don't recognize you. We live in a world today that is so image conscious. We live in a world that everybody looks at us from the outside. Now, I, I, not too long ago, I read an article, um, an article about a woman who uh, lived in Britain. Um, she spent 90,000 pounds on cosmetic surgery on her face. She did that so that somebody could marry her. Well, she succeeded, okay? She got married. And unfortunately, well, after she got married, she and her husband had a child. But unfortunately, when the child was born, the husband looked at the child and, and realized that the child looked nothing like the mother. In fact, the husband accused her of cheating on him. Well, um, she confessed to him that she did not cheat. She did not cheat on him. She was faithful to him. However, she spent 90,000 pounds uh, on cosmetic surgery to make herself look good. Well, her husband responded this way by suing her, by suing her for deceiving him into marrying her. My dear friends in Christ, the story illustrates a very important truth. The problem with humanity is not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. What Jeremiah was pointing out is we can look at people. They can look good. They could be wearing suits or they be, can be all dressed up, or they can have surgery or whatever. They can look so good on the outside, but we can't see what's on the inside. Inside the person could be very corrupt, dirty, and ugly. And so this is what Jesus was dealing with in our gospel lesson. So we might want to turn to uh, Mark chapter 7. I'm not going to do an entire 13 verse. Uh, I'm just going to take a few verses. Allow me to reread it to you. And I'm going to take it like a paragraph at a time. So Mark chapter 1, chapter 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from marketplace, from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the religious leaders from Jerusalem, they had traveled from Jerusalem all the way down to where Jesus was probably Capernaum, travel all the way down there to check him out, to see what's going on. And what they saw, they were not pleased with. In fact, what they saw was Jesus' disciples, they ate without a ceremonial washing. So, so what, so what was going on here is that Jesus' disciples were eating, and before they ate, they did not go through the ceremonial washing. Now, this had nothing to do with uh, washing hands because your hands were dirty. 
has nothing to do with hygiene, washing your hands away from viruses, dirt, or anything. What this was about was ceremonial washing. Okay. Verse 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? In other words, they were upset. Why don't your disciples practice what has been practiced for many centuries that was passed on to us, this tradition of ceremonial hand washing? Notice how Jesus responds. Jesus quotes from Isaiah. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to let go of the commands of God and holding on to human traditions. Do you see what Jesus was dealing with? These religious leaders was that they had a heart problem. Now the word of God reminds us that God sees the heart. He sees through all the exterior. What God really cares about and what he really looks at is our hearts. There's a story in 1 Samuel, and I, I'm sure most of us know the story. The first king of Israel was King Saul. Now notice what 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. Notice, notice Samuel, uh, you know, his comment about, you know, the appearance of Saul. 1 Samuel 9, 2. Saul was the most handsome man in Israel. Head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Did you hear that? So if there was a Mr. Israel, Saul would be voted number one. He would win the contest. If, he, if, this was, if, if there was a magazine cover, he would grace this magazine. The text tells us that he was the most handsome guy in Israel, all of Israel. Not only was he handsome, he looked good, but he also had the height, okay? He was big, he was strong, he was head and shoulders above everyone. So, so Saul was, he was tall, he was handsome. But unfortunately, he had a heart problem that led to his downfall. What happened is that God had instructed him to destroy the enemy, you know, whatever the enemy had left in other words, there was animals. He instructed Saul to destroy all of it. But instead, Saul kept some of it for his, the choicest lambs and animals, cattle, for his men. Well, God had rejected him. Then he sends the prophet Samuel to go to anoint the next king of Israel. Well, Samuel says to God, God, if I do that, Samuel will kill me. But God told Samuel, tell Saul that you're going to sacrifice, to worship in Bethlehem. And so God instructed Samuel to go look for the next king in the house of Jesse. Well, so Samuel arrives in Bethlehem. The elders of, of Bethlehem meet him. And he tells them he's there to sacrifice and worship. While he's worshiping, he invites the house of Jesse to attend. And during that time, he was looking for the next king of Israel. He was ready to anoint the next king. Well, the first person that showed up was Jesse's oldest son. Right away, he was big, tall, and handsome. In Samuel's mind, Samuel thought, this must be the one. But then God spoke to him. And notice what God says to him. And this is recorded in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Don't judge by his appearance or height. So he must have looked good. He must be tall. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, 
but the Lord looks at the heart. So it was not the first son, wasn't the second son, wasn't the third son, wasn't the fourth son, fifth, sixth, or even the seventh one. Finally, Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? Jesse says, I have a runt. <laughs> I got one left. Where is he? He's out tending to the sheep. Well, Samuel said, we're not going to finish here until, until you bring that son. And so they, they go out and bring David back. Well, the interesting part is when Samuel saw David, uh, the text says he was, grown, he was glowing with health means he looked healthy. He had a fine appearance. And then God says, anoint him. This is the one. The interesting part is, if you compare David to Saul, David was not as tall as Saul. David was not ugly, okay? He was handsome, but not as handsome as, as Saul. However, remember, God doesn't look at the outer appearance. He looks at a person's heart. In fact, David was called by God. God gave him that name, a man after God's own heart. In fact, David was in harmony with God. What mattered to God mattered to David. When David was out tending to the sheep, he would spend time singing praises to God. He would stand, spend time in prayer. Um, what was important to God was important to David. His heart was in harmony with God. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, um, you know, it, it explains it this way. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. So God's eyes are looking, okay? That he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You see, God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for somebody whose heart is completely his, completely devoted to him. He promises to come and support them. But this is not the Pharisees we're talking about. Okay? These Pharisees thought that if they would follow these traditions that were passed on from generations, that they would be acceptable to God, that they would be better than other people, they, that they would be more favored. And so the second point for, for this sermon is Changing the outside won't change the inside. Changing the outside is not going to affect the inside. In fact, you can spend money, you know, cosmetic surgery, tummy tuck, whatever it is. You can exercise and, you know, have these six-pack abs. You can do all these things. You can dress up. It does not change who you are on the inside. The religious leaders of the day really thought that if they had followed all these traditions, they would be good before God. They would be more favored. They had all these traditions. And by the way, um, since we're talking about traditions, you know, we all have traditions. Every church has its own traditions. We have family traditions. Um, I don't know if you have you heard about the tradition where there was a husband and wife? They were newlyweds. He was sitting at their dinner table going through the paper. You know, who reads newspaper today, right? Uh, it, it must be back then, yeah. He was reading the newspaper, and he noticed his newly married bride. She was preparing to bake ham for dinner. Well, before putting the ham um, in the you know, before baking the ham, she cut off a one-inch end of the ham and threw it away. And he commented, why do you cut off the ends of the ham before you bake it? That's some very good ham that you just threw away. She replied, I don't know. My mother always did it that way. And so, and so she decided to find out why. So afterwards, she called her mother 
and her mother picked up and she said, Mom, why do you always cut off the end of the ham before you bake it? Well, she said, well, grandmother always did that. And so she continued. She wants to find out why. And so she calls her, her grandfather uh, because grandmother ha grandma had already passed on. And she said, hey, Grandpa, um, you know, there's something I really want to know about our family tradition. Why did Grandma always cut off the end of the ham uh, before she baked it? Well, her grandfather said, you know, grandmother always, your grandmother always cut off the end of the ham because it wouldn't fit in the pan. <laughs> Friends, sometimes there are traditions that are helpful. <laughs> the important thing is to know why you practice those traditions. When they become cumbersome, they are considered useless. Now, the Pharisees of Jesus' time had these traditions that they elevated. They made it so important that it was more important than the word of God. And so again, notice what Jesus, notice what Jesus said about them. He said, Isaiah was right, you hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, what matters to God is our hearts. The last point, changing the inside can change the outside. Changing the inside can change the outside. One time Jesus was telling a story. I'm pretty sure there are Pharisees there. He told this story on purpose. He said one time there was a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now you have to understand, Pharisees are these religious leaders that Jesus called them hypocrites, meaning actors in the Greek. Uh, on the outside, they look all put together, but on the inside, they're rotten, self-righteous people. And here are, here's a tax collector. In their society, tax collectors were considered traitors. Tax collectors were always Jewish. They collected taxes for the Romans. The Jewish people hated the Romans, okay? For somebody to, to collect taxes for the enemy was considered treason. Not only did they collect taxes, whatever they added on top of that was their salary. So you can see that. Nobody really likes to pay taxes, okay? Period. Taxes are things people don't want to pay. Secondly, if you're, if you're collecting for the enemy, it makes it worse. Number three, not only are you collecting, but you're adding your stipend on top of that. That's why they, th they, they thought, you know, tax collectors were considered cheats and scums, okay? So you have this scum of society, and you have this, have this Pharisee, Jesus says, a Pharisee and tax collector went into the temple and prayed. Okay. The Pharisee prayed to God and said, God, I thank you. I am not like those rotten people who do bad things. I'm not greedy like them. I don't rob. I don't cheat. You know, I don't do all this stuff. In fact, I fast twice a week and I tithe. I thank you. I'm not like that 30 tax collector there. Then Jesus said, the tax collector wouldn't even go up close to, to the front, wouldn't even look up to heaven, and he beat his own chest, and he said, f he said, God, forgive me. I am a poor sinner. And then Jesus asked, who do you think was justified when they left the temple? And of course, the answer was, of course, the tax collector. His heart was pure before God. See, God is not looking for perp perfect people. He's looking for people whose heart is for him. Not perfect people, not sinless people, but people who will admit when they sin. And so this was the tax collector. And so you see, you can't change, you can change, when you change the inside, then you can change the outside. Well, let me kind of bring this to a close with a uh, story that I heard. It's a true story. So many of years ago, um, 
there was this um, there was this man. Uh, he he lived on the west coast and he owned a large trucking business, a large trucking business. In fact, uh, what was going on in his personal life was that um, uh, his wife, um, you know, his marriage was on the rocks. Um, you know, his son, his relationship with him is, was damaged. And so he decided to look for a marriage counselor, one of the best. Well, he looked up and he looked through the ads and he found this one counselor uh, who was one of the best, highly sought after. Well, the problem was that, you know, this guy was in the west, East Coast while he lived on the West. Well, he decided to go ahead anyway, so it took him four or five weeks to finally get an appointment. When he showed up in the uh, counselor's office, um, you know, he showed up and the counselor asked him, what are you doing here? Well, he said, I'm discouraged. My wife and I are having a hard time in our marriage. My relationship with my son is strained and my business is losing money. The counselor, the counselor asked again, what are you doing here? What is your problem? He says, I'm depressed because my wife and I are struggling in our marriage. My relationship with my son is strained and my business is losing money. The counselor said, you told me that. Why are you here? And you can imagine my wife and I can't get along. My son and I are in a battle. My business is losing money. I'm depressed. The counselor said, happiness is an inside job. Why are you here? Right away, the man got up. He wrote the counselor a check. He put it on the table, and he was about to leave. The counselor got him and said, excuse me, sir, did I offend you? And he said, no. You gave me the answer I was looking for. I thought I was discouraged and depressed because of my relationship and business. I realized I was discouraged and depressed because I chose to be. See, joy is an inside job. It's on the inside. So since I'm talking about that, you know, it is not your job, it is not your boss's job to make you happy. It is not your spouse's job to make you happy because I hear people say, you know, he doesn't make me happy anymore, she doesn't make me happy. No, it is not other people's job to make you happy. There is a saying, you can't control what people do to you, but you can control what happens in you, okay? Um, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, no, he's talking about attitude, but, but notice these two, this, these two sentences. He writes, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me. 90% of how I react to it, and so it is, you are in charge. Friends, God looks at our hearts. Changing the outside will not change the inside. Changing the, only by changing the inside can the outside change. If you ever have a feeling or ever feel like that you're that there's something between you and God. Uh, John reminds us, First John one nine, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all, not some, but all unrighteousness. Everything can be wiped away when we turn, confess, and turn to Jesus. King David, when he sinned and repented, he wrote Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. Remember, friends, God looks at the heart. He loves you. 
He wants you to know that whatever we do on the outside won't affect the inside. It's what we do on the inside that matters most. Having clean hearts is better than having clean hands. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Father, thank you that you sent your son Jesus, that through his suffering and death on the cross and through his blood, our sins are forgiven. We are made righteous. We thank you that through your son, we stand before you as your righteous children and we come before you in prayer asking that you will give our um, doctors or health professionals or government officials, give them wisdom to continue to guide us for especially the days ahead as we continue to fight, as we continue to struggle with uh, COVID-19, especially with this new variant. Lord, we ask for protection for our church family, for those who are listening, their families as well, protect them from this virus. We also ask that you will continue to uh, guide our government officials, help them to make good decisions. And we also ask that you will help us to continue to look to you, especially during times of unrest, times of trouble. Lord, we thank you for all of your goodness, for reminding us that you are always with us, no matter where we are, no matter where we go. We ask for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We're choosing celebration, breaking into freedom. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. We cast aside our shadows, trust you with our sorrows. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. We're Stop.